You've waited all year, and this Saturday, it's finally here. Old Navy's famous $1 flip-flops are back for just one day only. Polish up your petties and hurry in for flip-flops for the whole family for just a buck. This Saturday only at Old Navy and OldNavy.com. Valid 624, limit 10. Solid colors only. Blog Talk Radio. Dr. Megan McAllister was already pretty unusual when she encountered the man in the black suit that night. What Division I Agent Echo didn't know was that she was even more special. But he'd find out soon enough. Stephanie Osborne uses the urban legend of operatives who show at UFO sightings and make things disappear to craft her vision of the universe we don't know. The Division I series chronicles this via Recruit Omega and experienced partner Echo as they handle everything from lost children to alien assassination and more. Book one, Alpha and Omega, is available in print and ebook from your favorite bookseller. Every author has a one story that hits close to home for them. This is Yvonne Mason's. This book is very personal to me. The 50s has been idealized as a time of prosperity and growth for some. Those with mental and physical challenges often faced scorn and ridicule and were destined to be left in so-called hospitals to wither and die. Dreamcatcher, Failure Was Never an Option, is the uplifting story of a man named Stan and his family's courage to defy the odds and succeed in an era where no merit was seen in the challenged. It is the true story of my brother who was mentally and physically challenged. It is because of my brother Stan that I am a successful author. Dreamcatcher, Failure Was Never an Option, is available through Amazon and BarnesandNoble.com now. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Or this is awesome. of things that I go forgot. Bump in the night. Rejoice, as there is a new collection of creepy tales to keep your spine tingling and your blood running cold. Oh, God. <laughs> the brainchild of prolific author Yvonne Mason. Welcome to your nightmare as an anthology of stories from a gifted batch of writers specializing in keeping you up at night. Whether you love gruesome tales of murder and mayhem, or you prefer quaint tales of scary happenings, welcome to your nightmare sure to please the inner psychopath and wet even the most insatiable horror appetite. Welcome to Your Nightmare is available now on Amazon.com. Well, let's try this again. It has been one of those days. I am now working on three weeks of maybe six hours sleep, so y'all bear with me. If I mispronounce words or butt into my own ad, just... Ignore me. It'll be all right. This is Off the Chain. I am your host, Yvonne Mason. As you all well know, anything goes on this show, and that's why we call it Off the Chain. The beginning ad, um, the first one is the first book in author Stephanie Osborne's Division One series. She is one of my guests tonight on my show, the other one being author Dan Hollyfield, who is also a musician, and we will get to them shortly. The second two books are mine. Dreamcatcher Failure Was Never an Option is about my brother who's mentally and physically challenged, and to him, failure is never an option. Failure is only an option if you don't try. The other one is Welcome to Your Nightmare. It is an anthology of horror stories written by about 30 authors, some published, some never been published before, and in that beautiful little book, is a short story by my friend Nicholas Grabowski, and any of you who know Nicholas know why he is so special. He is the owner and publisher of Black Bed Sheets Publishing. So if you're looking for a publisher in horror, contact Nick. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to tell you, I am so excited. We are a little more than 800 listeners away from this show being at 10,000 listeners, just the show itself. That doesn't include all the podcasts. When you add all the podcasts, we're over 21,000. 21,000 listeners, ladies and gentlemen, and this show is not even a year old. It will not be a year old until the 27th of next month. It is because of all of y'all, the listeners, 
and my guest, such as my guest tonight, Stephanie Osborne and Dan Hollyfield, that this show is successful. I am just a facilitator. If it weren't for all of my wonderful guests, I would still probably sit here and twiddle my thumbs and wonder why nobody was listening. So it's all about them. It's all about you all. And I am very pleased to announce that we are heard in over 70 countries. To me, that is just amazing. Little countries I've never even heard of are listening to us. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. And for the um, my friends down under in Australia, thank you for being my biggest supporters on Blog Talk Radio. Y'all are beating out the U- good old USA 3 to 1, and I appreciate and love each and every one of you for it. We have two new sponsors to the show. They are both authors. The first one, her name is Diane Motes, and she has this little neat book for children, and I highly recommend it. Pepper Neely, Pet Sits, Magical Animals. In the first of the series, The Supernatural Pet Sitter, the magic thief, someone begins stealing the magic from Pepper's animal friends. She has to find the magic thief before the magic thief finds her. The Supernatural Pet Sitter by Diane Moat is now available on Amazon as an e-book or paperback. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you're looking for something for your wee ones to be entertained by this summer other than television or computers or iPads, go on Amazon and order Diane Moat's The Supernatural Pet Sitter. The first book in the series is called The Magic Thief. And read it to your children. You won't be sorry. Also, another new sponsor to the show, author Darren Cox. His book is called Don't Let the Enemy Steal From You, A Crown of Thorns to a Crown of Righteousness. And the, the, the synopsis goes like this. Don't let any man, anything, or any situation in your life ever steal the things that God has ordained for you to have. One of the great things of my generation that I see, one of the great things that breaks my heart, is I see a generation that has no idea of the destiny and the future and the hope that God has for our generation. I look at young people and hopelessness. There's so much. We have the cars. We have the entertainment. We have the lights. We have everything the world could offer a generation, and yet there's never been a generation more unhappy, more depressed, and more hopeless. So order his book today, ladies and gentlemen. Darren Cox, Don't Let the Enemy Steal from You, A Crown of Thorns to a Crown of Righteousness. And I thank both of these authors for agreeing to be sponsors on this show. If you would like to be a sponsor and place an ad, go to advertisecast.com, look up off the chain. My prices are reasonable. And I do it so that authors that that for whatever reason don't want to be on the show, they can still be heard. And I'm not going to rob y'all. I'm not going to take advantage of you because none of us are becoming millionaires out there as indie authors or musicians. We do it because we love what we do. So that being said, ladies and gentlemen, tonight's guest, as I said, author Stephanie Osborne and author Dan Hollyfield joins us. Dan was born in November of 1957 at almost the same moment that Sputnik 2 was launched. Now, you all that were born after 57, you have no idea what I'm talking about. However, the two events are not, in fact, related, though he would like to think so. Dan's father was a machinist graduating from the General Motors Institute in the mid-1950s. After fleeing the harsh Michigan winters for a return to the family's ancestral home, Dan's father began working in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, making toys for the physicists to play with. Dan's mother is an artist specializing in oils, china painting, glass painting, and multimedia home crafts. So it only stands to reason that Dan would have these crafts of being creative as well as making projects out of nothing. Now, few can claim the varied background of Stephanie Osborne, the interstellar woman of mystery. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm very honored to call these two people friends and fellow authors because they both amaze me with their intellect and their 
their conversation, I could just sit and listen to them all day. She is a veteran of more than 20 years in the civilian space program, as well as various military space defense programs. Stephanie worked on numerous space shuttle flights and the International Space Space Station and counts the training of astronauts on her resume. Her space experience also includes space labs and ISS operations, variable star astrophysics, Martian Elyon geophysics, radiation physics, and nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons effects. Stephanie's travels have taken her to the top of Pikes Peak across the world's highest suspension bridge, down into gold mines, and in the footsteps of dinosaurs, through groves of giant sequoias, and even to the volcanoes of the Cascade Range in the Pacific Northwest, where Stephanie was present for several Phyriatic eruptions of Mount St. Helens. Now she's retired from space work, but she has trained her sights on writing, so her mystery continues. Welcome, guys. I'm so glad that y'all are here with me tonight. Thank you for having us, Yvonne. Y'all oh, make yes. me tired. Y'all make me <laughs> tired reading about you. <laughs> oh, try living a day in our footsteps. No, Good thank grief. You. No, thank you. I, trust me, I could not even lace your shoes, either one of you. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all are amazing. So, no, no, not really. Uh, I'm just this ordinary guy. I just happen to have a mind that does not know how to shut off. And Stephanie's the one that amazes me. I mean, good <laughs> grief. No, no, I'm no, telling you. I'm up. What you just said, Dan, I was going to say completely and, and totally, my mind does not shut off. It's constantly running, so I have to constantly keep it busy. When you're not tripping over your computer cord. When I'm not tripping over my computer cord, yes. Well, but but think about it, Stephanie. Now, now that we brought this into perspective, because your mind is always running and because you are always in hyper overdrive, why in the world would you even think about a computer cord in the way anyway? Well, for for the listeners, I, I have uh, several times now managed. I have a laptop, and I keep. I, I generally do my writing in my recliner because it's comfortable. Um, <laughs> I've got a hassock uh, that I keep nearby when I need to get up and go get food or or fill my water bottle or whatever, and I sit the laptop on the hassock. I keep tripping over the darn cable. And I've already busted the the laptop screen once and had to replace it. And I I injured my ankle on a, a, on a trip to Disney and I was just about to get it well and I tripped again this afternoon <laughs> on the <laughs> Table and re-injured it, as well as snatching my neck, but good. So, yeah, um, Steph's kind of been playing human pinball today. Uh, so we've so. decided, ladies and gentlemen, we're probably going to put her in bubble wrap to, to save her from herself because, and and once we start talking about her, her works, you will understand why we have to put her in bubble wrap. <laughs> <laughs> You, force you fields. I keep telling you, force fields. There you, yeah. <laughs> there you go. All right, let's play catch up because it's been a minute since y'all have been on the show. So, Dan, may I defer to Stephanie, being as you are a true Southern gentleman, and understand when I say that Southern gentlemen always allow ladies to go first? I would insist. There you go. All right, Miss Steph, tell me what you've been up to. Oh my! Uh, I've got a brand new um, I've got a brand new series out called Division One, and I've already got I, I'm I'm just having a blast writing in it. Two books are already in release. Uh, book one is Alpha and Omega, and book two is a small medium at large. Book three comes out next month. It's titled A Very Inconvenient Christmas. Um, there's a pun involved in that. 
Book four will come out in October, and that one is titled Tour de Force. I just got done with book five uh, and sent it to the beta readers last Friday. It's called Trojan Horse, and if all goes well, it should be released this coming January 2018. Uh, yes, I've been going nuts writing in this in this series. Um, I, I don't. I've rarely ever in my life written as fast as I'm writing these books. It's just I'm just having such fun with it. I've also been invited to participate in uh, something like three or four uh, anthologies, so I have to do some, some background reading on some of those and sit down and actually start writing some short stories here very shortly. Um, I'm dinking around with turning the Division One series into audiobooks. Mm. Uh, I'm still working on trying to figure out exactly what needs to be done and the best way to do it. Um, many people have told me they really, really would love to hear me read, you know, read the books myself. So, and ladies uh, and gentlemen, I'm going to interrupt you just a minute, sweetheart, if you don't mind, because uh, since we're on audio, the first ad that you heard, ladies and gentlemen, on the Division One series, that was Stephanie's voice, by the way. She has a great audio voice. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I wanted to throw that in there and, so you get even more people saying, yeah, do the books, do the books. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, and I'm responsible for some of that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, because, because the background music is Dan on that on that commercial. Dan Dan composed the background music for that commercial. And uh, I, I gave you your first uh, voiceover work for uh, the the thing, the, 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 the bonus track for uh, Displaced Detective Suite. Yes. That's true. You had that you had not true. really uh, decided to venture into voice acting, and it's like, well, um, you really need to do this because I can't think of anybody else that could be the voice of Sky <laughs> except you. Well, yeah, I, you know, it's it was one of those things to where it just uh, it sort of started to grow, and the fact that I had a podcast for a little over a year on. Um, matters of space and solar weather. I kind of got used to doing uh, doing the voice work and the sound editing for it. So now I'm looking at exactly what I need to do to get the quality and and everything the way I want it, and 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 how the the various and sundry companies like Audible and stuff like that how they want it done. So I'm I'm looking at all these things and I'm starting to work on it. And uh, and try to get uh, some audiobooks going. Hopefully, hopefully by the end of the year. And see, if, ladies if and all, gentlemen, all goes well. This, this this is just one more thing we as indie authors do. We go where others fear to tread simply because we can. People spend thousands and thousands of dollars on having audiobooks produced, and indie authors just go out and do it because we can. Dan, would that be a fair statement? Yes, it certainly would. Um, I wound up being inspired by this show and adding uh, video editorials where I just sit in front of a camera and uh, try and limit myself to 15 minutes of blathering to uh, add to my written editorials for Apelion. And uh, I've been getting quite a few extra people watching the videos and I'm not I'm not used to that kind of thing. <laughs> well see, this is and this is one of the reasons that I love this show because just like you stepping out and you and Stephanie both stepping out of your comfort zones and saying, "Well, let's try this." It's become successful because you tried it. It it's it gives confidence and self assurance that. So what if I fall on my face? Yvonne does it re- regularly. <laughs> no, that's not true. Thanks. You're 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 the very definition of excellence, my dear. Oh gee, I'm blushing now. So Dan, catch. <laughs> 
not really. Catch us up to speed on where you are, and then we will start delving into some other good stuff. Uh, well, uh, I've got a short story that I wrote uh, some time ago for a, a writing contest that was accepted for an anthology being put out. Uh, w- w- the actual physical pub- publisher is in England, mm-hmm. but uh, the two editors that are in charge of the anthology, one is in Italy and the other is in Canada. And uh, let's see, it is, uh, the title of the, the anthology is Steam Powered Dream Engines, and it's all uh, steampunk oriented stories. Mm-hmm. And the title of mine is uh, The Dark Side of Diablo Canyon. And it's a, it's basically a Western, which I had never really tried to write before, but it's got steampunk elements, including uh, something very suspiciously close to H.G. Wells' uh, Martian tripods and uh, uh, some stuff that I had to research for uh, uh, to, so it would fit into... Uh, Native American mythology uh, in the uh, the uh, the West, uh, somewhere uh, north and slightly east of um, the uh, the the cliff uh, the cliff dwellings uh, that are are, are so famous uh, among archaeologists and whatnot, and uh, I just. I just dove into this thing, and it's it's about eight thousand words, just just shy of eight thousand words, and uh, I did my best. And I've had a few of the readers uh, from the contest go, "Damn, you write Native Americans as if they were really just ordinary folks." And I go, "Well, yeah, they are. Duh, they're." <laughs> I mean, good grief, Stephanie! You were you were a, 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 a cop on a res, right? Oh yeah. Um, arguably, uh, depending on who you talk to in the family, one side of the family says that, yay, verily, my couple great back grandmother was full blooded Cherokee, and another side of the family says, no, she wasn't. So it just depends <laughs> on on who you talk to. But yes, I've I've worked uh, with uh, several. Reservations. Uh, I, I've I've worked with several different Native American groups. Um, so I'm I'm blonde. So I, you know the rest of my heritage, my ancestry is largely Celtic. Uh, so some of them accept me and some of them don't. Um, but you know it's it's yeah it's they're regular people. I mean, what is the big deal here? <laughs> exactly. Well, I did have one critic where uh, he was kind of upset that I didn't have them doing uh, Hollywood talk for Indians. And I'm going, oh, well, Lord. dude, uh, uh, grow up. Yeah, this, really. is, this, <laughs> this is reality here. Well, now, and, it, uh, what's interesting is that it turns out that the, the UG thing evidently sort of kind of does arise from Cherokee because um, the word for yes in Cherokee is uh, uh, or thereabouts. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't claim to Cherokee fluency, but it's, um, it's, it's something pretty similar to uh, uh, which sounds like they should be saying no in English, but they're not. They're saying yes. So, so that you know, but yeah, they they didn't go around going, "Ugh, me he big chief," you know. No, good grief. Not only no, that, but, but they had their own language, which the white man made them abolish to speak English because, who knows, whatever reason. But when they learned English, they learned a very good English, and, and to denigrate them as yeah. being idiots really pisses me off. Well, they, oh, they, me they, too, me too. There was a, uh, a family legend that's since been disproved by DNA evidence that uh, we had uh, uh, Cherokee ancestors in, in my family on my mother's side, 
And it turns out, no, there's not a single drop of Native American DNA in our makeup. No, we're uh, Turkish and Italian and Greek and French and Scots and Vikings. <laughs> Which explains my sword collection, doesn't it? So don't push him off. <laughs> yeah, you took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> he has his own inner war going on here with all these different countries. <laughs> no, it's not a war. I'm just a farmer, really. Yeah, okay. Dan, Dan honey, if, if that's the story you want to stick with, go right ahead. <laughs> that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> my brother's found uh, evidence of my mom's side of the family going back to 912 A.D. to some Viking uh, king of some little tribe somewhere. And I can't even pronounce the name because, God, because my, my mouth won't go that way. Uh, and, 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 Stephanie, would... yeah, and, and Stephanie doesn't speak fluent Norse either, so she can't help you out. No, no. Oh, no. no. Even though but, I uh, ancestry in that in that regard i do have viking in my ancestry as well so but yeah, yeah no slip. i don't the names either yeah, honey yeah, you are every out. inch of shield maiden <laughs> i want to you touch got on my back something. anytime, anytime. The stuff hits the fan <laughs> <So, laughs> i want to i want to go back to something because I feel this is really important, and I know Dan does, and that you're very, you are very involved in reading literacy. Now, is it just for children, or is it for adults and children? To whom speaks thou? I speak thou to you. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, I am, um, and and no, it's not just children. Um, I've I am very much uh, supportive of literacy efforts. And not just in terms of of reading and stuff like that. I am for um, kids knowing the basics, reading, writing, and arithmetic. You know, mm-hmm. yep. um, and and because because at various times I have I have tutored um, elementary through college age kids, and I'm I'm shocked in this day and age to tutor a high school senior in a private school in Algebra 2 and take her all the way through an algebra problem, and she gets down to what I refer to as plug and chug, where you plug in the actual numbers and crank out the final answer. Uh, And and she gets it all the way down to 2 times 13, and she reaches for her calculator. Oh, no. And I smacked her hand away, and I said, no, you should be able to do that in your head. She couldn't do it. Oh, that's, a sh- that's sad. She even, she even struggled to multiply it out on paper because nobody, ta- had, proper, nobody had properly taught her the mul- multiplication tables. <coughs> yeah, I mean, and, and, and the kids that can't read... They don't read because they can't. Right. And and I'm just I'm shocked and I'm and I'm horrified and it actually scares me for our future because these kids are our future and yes, if they they're are. not learning these fundamental things, then they're not going to do what Dan and you and I have done and read voraciously Mm-mm. because they can't. And, and when when the when the power goes out at McDonald's and they're trying to take orders, they're not going to know how to write an order down on a piece of paper and then make change out of the drawer by counting back from the twenty dollar bill that you gave them when it was a dollar ninety eight for the for the final bill. They don't know how to count back up to the twenty dollar bill. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, okay. and uh, I think the problem's been worse by the modern educational system's insistence on promoting kids for attendance yes. Yes. rather than actual learning something. Now, I was hazed for uh, ruining
setting the uh, grading curve for some of the classes that I was in in school. Yeah, I'm not because surprised. my my parents were really strict about you learn this, <laughs> you learn how to do your schoolwork. We're depending on you, and you've got to do this. And so I went to class, and I did the problems, and I did the the reading, and I did everything else, and uh, I took the tests, and I got better grades than most of the kids. And um, I sometimes went home with a black eye because I got better grades from most of the kids. So. But, but look where you are today. Yeah, I'm working in a factory, and I'm writing for fun, and uh, hoping one day that it'll pay off. But, and not uh, only are you writing for fun, Dan, but you create some of the most beautiful music I have ever heard in my entire life. And you cannot create music any more than you can write if you don't have the basics. Right. Well, that's that's down to my parents as well. Um, there was there was always a, a radio going or a record player going. Uh, uh, school friends would come over. My mom would be washing the dishes, and she'd be singing along with the radio. And they go, "Is she a professional? She sounds like somebody we've heard before." And I go, "No, it's just mom. She's just good." And here, you see this oil painting on the wall? She did that. And uh, you see this uh, welding out here on this uh, lawnmower where it broke? Well, Dad did that, and. Um, I'm just, <laughs> I'm a product of my time, basically. To, Everything I am is, is due to my family. We need, yes, to ask, we need to actually sit down and start comparing genealogy because that sounded so much like my upbringing. We've got to be related somewhere. <laughs> uh, my, I think my, it was the time. It, 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 it may be, but, I mean, my mom painted and, you know, she tells stories of having the radio on to some musical station and me being sound asleep in my crib, but I'm bouncing up and down in time to the music, sound asleep. <laughs> you know? Oh, Mama could sing every lyric to every Beatles song that came on the radio in the 60s, and I didn't even know they were Beatles songs until the 70s. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I was I was listening to uh, everything that they had, and listening to the radio stations, and uh, I got exposed to uh, uh, all the, the the swing music and big bands and jazz and uh, uh, what would have passed for grunge if jazz had had a grunge age, and uh, as well as. Uh, 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 50s pop and, and Motown and everything else. And it's just my folks were just totally unashamed of going, hey, we like this, listen to it. And that's the way I got exposed to it. Did Did your mom ever watch, you remember the old TV show Name That Tune? But it's not that old. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I don't. I don't know if Mom did, but compared, I did. And uh, compared to probably some of our listeners, it may well be that old Dan yeah. that really <laughs> <laughs> or the Gong Show. Um, yeah. uh, Mom, we're of Mom, an age, dear. <sighs> Mom could watch that show, and and she could beat every contestant on it. You know, I mean, it was just amazing to watch. What you and like me in it. Jeopardy. Huh? Uh, I'd sit there and I'd be reading a book while my parents were watching Jeopardy, and they'd, they'd give the answer, and I'd go, here's the question. And I would and then turn a page and go back to the, the uh, yes. Arthur C. Clarke novel I was reading or, yes. or, or Lord of the Rings or whatever. Yes. Yes, same here. Well, Come when up, y'all think it, about it. Answer when, the question and go back to reading, yes. Right. But when when y'all think about it, because I am of that generation, and our entertainment was music and books. Because television didn't, we didn't have a TV in our house until I was 13 years old, and I was born in 51. So the entertainment was the radio and books and conversation. 
and I think we were better off for it. Well, uh, we've got more uh, sources of entertainment now, mm-hmm. but it's kind of not as challenging. You you don't. No. It's yeah. not as much reading or uh, listening to an, uh, the Vienna uh, Orchestra on the air and trying to pick out, my God, is that an oboe solo or is that uh, a string quartet? I can't tell. But uh, nowadays everything just gets, it's a fire hose mm-hmm. of information getting blasted at everybody, and they pick and choose like from uh, some Chinese restaurant buffet, and you get the things you like, but you don't get exposed to the things that you might like if you just only give it a chance. Or that you would like, but you didn't know about. Right. Oh, yes. Yes. Now, speaking of I remember I had one uh, eureka moment when I was a teenager in high school, and uh, I had just listened to something that I had played uh, multiple times when I was was a child, and all of a sudden it just clicked. And I go, I wish I had taken piano lessons. That's gorgeous. (laughs) It never worked before, but now it works. And uh, I remember exactly what piece of music it was. It was uh, an orchestra piece recreating uh, Deflator Mouse. And there was a very uh, atonal bit that was going on. And at first I thought, that sounds horrible. They're not in tune. And then all of a sudden that one day, it just clicked in my mind and I figured out exactly how those chords worked. And, now and it, it shows up in the stuff I do now. It really I does. I was going to ask that. I was going to ask you that. If it... Because of that one piece of music. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you have not heard Dan's music, Dan, tell them the name of your music. And, yes, it can be found on all of the music spheres out there. And he also did a soundtrack for Stephanie's Displaced Detective series that will absolutely blow you away. So tell them the uh, that's name an interesting of- story as well. Um, uh, I, I had been reading Stephanie's books for years, and she finally started writing the Displaced Detective series. And I had read the first uh, four books and was waiting on the, the, the fifth one to arrive in the mailbox. And uh, I was messing around with this music program that I have in the computer, and I, I, I thought, whoa, well, let me do something here and there was this amazing violin part that just captivated me it, it it's it's really simple but the way it the way it built to a conclusion when you pieced it all together uh it it, it just became something more than the sum of its parts and i sent this one piece of music to stephanie i just emailed it to her and she emailed me back a little while later and said, can you do more of this? You just made my dad cry, and he doesn't even like music. And I'm going, sure, I can do more. It's take me a month or two, but I can, sure. And all of a sudden, I sat down and I go, well, this fits, and this fits. Oh, that drum part's totally wrong. Oh, I like that synthesizer. Ooh, that's a good sound effect. And it wound up being uh, what turned out to be my third album, which was uh, Displaced Detective Suite. And it's all inspired and based on Stephanie's writing. So, Steph, how did, but, how did you feel? I listened to that first track, and... I, I I don't even I don't even know I'm a writer and I don't have the words to express it, but it was like I could see the Displaced Detective Suite is the Displaced Detective series is uh, where I yank Sherlock Holmes 
from the Victorian era of an alternate reality and dump him down into the modern day. And he can't go back. Um, because in his version of events, he and Moriarty were both supposed to die at the Reichenbach Falls. Um, so I listened to that that one track, and it was the violin, and I could imagine Holmes in a fit of melancholy and in a homesick longing, sitting down with his violin and playing it. Mm-hmm. And I and I could see it in my head. And the more, you know, that's when I came back and said, can you do more of these? <laughs> and and as he began to turn out the, the other tracks in what became the album, um, I found that it was, having written the books, it was very much akin to listening to the soundtrack for a movie and remembering the different scenes that went with that particular track. Wow. It was yeah, it was it was the soundtrack for my series. It was the score. And it was just absolutely gorgeous. And it 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 was it was actually a little bit later than that, but yeah, I I let my parents hear it, and my dad is not over fond of music, uh, partly because he has, um, and I guess has always had to a limited extent, a slight uh, hearing deficit in certain frequencies. Mm. Uh, so music often sounds discordant to him, but he listened to that and he loved it. And like because, I said, he's not that big on music. Probably because he could hear the different sounds and the different ambiance of the music, and it was pleasant to him as opposed to fingernails going down a chalkboard. Yeah, I would think so. But, yeah, everybody that's ever read the series and listened to the music is like, oh, my gosh, if they ever make a movie of this, they need to use these for the for the score. You know, Some, so Ladies and the, gentlemen... This is this is my advice, ladies and gentlemen. And no, you cannot do it now. You have to wait till after the show, or you're going to miss something. After the show, you go on Amazon and you order Stephanie's Displaced Detective series. Order them all because they're fan- I've read them, and I want to kill Holmes myself sometimes. <laughs> I want to just shake him. But then, while you're ordering the books. Order Dan's Displaced Detective Suite and listen to the music as you're reading the books. And I guarantee you, just like Stephanie says, it, it will all blend together and become a movie in your mind. I mean, it, it, these two people blend so well with this particular series, music-wise, word-wise. It, it, it's unbelievable. You would think that they sat down and choreographed it face to face but they didn't yeah no, stephanie, did. stephanie never heard any of it until i had a finished piece to send to her yeah. i was i was taking what i had read and i turned it into oh this fits with this scene oh this music evokes this character Let's see how that goes. And and she did ask me for some particular themes to write as as I was getting further and further into the project. But it's it's all down to how good a writer that Stephanie is. Mm-hmm. That she was able to inspire me to to hear these sounds and piece them together like a jigsaw puzzle and have it fit so well with what she'd written. It's it's all down to her talent. It really is. Okay. Uh, I just put it together. We're going to get into the inspiration society here in a minute. Well, uh, no, thing, no, no, no. But the thing is, when you think about it, Stephanie, we as writers, this is our ultimate dream is to move someone so much that not only do they crawl into the book and after they finish the book, like me, they want to kill Holmes themselves because sometimes he's so stupid, but to to move someone who, who as they're reading the book, hears 
music to go with the scenes and the characters and and the plot of the book, that does say so much for you as an author because not many authors, they, they may strive to get there, but I would dare say that even those, some of those that publish with the big six don't ever get there because they, they don't, they leave something out of the story. And I don't know if what they leave out is their soul or understanding homes. Let's take homes because you know homes inside and out. You know Conan probably as good as Conan knows Conan. So you captured the essence of homes in this book, and even though it's a modern-day tale, you were able to make him so believable that Dan, in turn, says, oh, I hear music. I've got to write it down. Well, well, I, I've got to say, if they if they want to listen without having to pay anything, they can look me up on Bandcamp and play songs for free. And uh, if they if they like that, they can buy a download. If they want a physical CD, please do me the favor of going to Create Space rather than Amazon, because I get paid better if somebody uh-huh. buys a CD from Create Space. Uh, if you buy one from Amazon, then Create Space and Amazon both take a cut, and I get very little out of it. So there you go, ladies uh, and gentlemen. Go to Create Space. So Stephanie. What is your take on this? Oh, geez, I don't know. Um, you know, I I had the brag, idea. Brag. Huh? Brag, brag, please brag. Oh, well, <laughs> I, I I'm not a, a I'm not a particularly a braggart. Um, you know, I had the idea for the series when I was reading an anthology. It was a science fiction anthology, but it was all Sherlock Holmes stories. Because some of Conan Doyle's original uh, stories were science fictional in nature. Mm-hmm. And Which so, anthology was it? I, you know, I don't remember now. It's been years. And I've got a dozen of them myself. I couldn't remember myself if I tried, but I, go ahead. I, I sat down and I, and I started thinking about it, and I said, you know what, I would love to do something like this. And then I thought, well, the anthology was set in the Victorian era, so it was using Victorian era science and technology. Wouldn't it be cool if I could find a way to use modern science and technology? And so then I thought, well, what if I yank him from an alternate reality and dump him into the modern day? Well, with with my science background, I was off and running, researching could this could this happen? Could this work? What what would I need to do? And I, the next thing I know, I'm I'm miles deep into something called M theory, and and you know, and I'm the idea starts starts coming, and all at once it's like wham. Now the thing you have to know is that I have read Sherlock Holmes since I was a kid. All right, I've I've I can't tell you the number of times. I have read through all of the stories, all of the stories. I've got the great big thick compendium with the mustard and rust-colored dust cover. I've seen all of the uh, Jeremy Brett Sherlock Holmes series. He didn't quite, he didn't live long enough to film all of them, but they got most of them in the can. Um, I've, I've, I mean, just, I'm just a Sherlock Holmes fan, okay, and have been since I was a kid. So I knew the stuff backwards, forwards, and sideways. And suddenly, when I realized, okay, I can yank him from this alternate reality to our modern day, and I went, oh, my gracious, I know what to do. And I started writing. And the average science fiction or mystery novel runs around uh, around 100,000 words per book. And it's not uncommon to take, you know, six months or a year for an author to write a novel. The first story came in in rough draft at 215,000 words 
inside two months. Wow. It was like holding a wide open fire hose all by myself. Um, I, I, you know, my husband would bring me my dinner in front of the computer, you know, <laughs> um, and and it just came pouring out. And it wound up my, when I when my publisher my publisher originally didn't want to, to publish it. Uh, it. It was traditionally published through a small press, Twilight Times Books. And um, she didn't want to publish it because she said it's too long, and I don't really want to break it up into two volumes. Well, she gave it some thought, and after a period of time, she said, well, you know what, I do want to publish it. Do you mind breaking it up? And I said, as long as it gets published, I, I'm, I'm good. You know, I'm happy with that. So we broke it up into two volumes, and it became known as the Case of the Displaced Detective, Volume 1, The Arrival, and Volume 2, At Speed. Um, because by the time I was done polishing it, um, it went up to clo very close to 250,000 words. The bad thing was I tried to cut it down to 100,000 words. I couldn't do it. Mm -mm. My agent tried to cut it down to 100,000 words. She couldn't do it. My publisher tried to do so. Her editor-in-chief tried to do so. The, it was two stories entwined, and you could not, you couldn't separate them, and you couldn't cut it down. You lost too much of the essence of the two different storylines. Because one storyline was an origin story, getting Holmes to the modern day and getting him settled as a modern man, modern detective, and the other was a spy ring was after the device that brought him to the modern day. And it, you couldn't separate the two. Um, so we wound up publishing it as a, a two-volume story, uh, which I, I do apologize to my readers for that because it just purely by happenstance, the first volume does end on a cliffhanger. That was not intentional. That just happened to be where that occurred. Um, but it was so a good place to split it. It was. It really it was. was. It was a really good place to split it. If I if I had been given the job of editing and trying to format this, I couldn't have picked a better spot. Um, in general, uh, cliffhangers are frowned upon. They 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 work for TV shows and the like. But in general, for books, cliffhangers are frowned upon. Somebody forgot to tell R. R. Martin that. <laughs> <laughs> well, what what we wound up doing was, and the reason is because, as a general rule, the way most the way most uh, publishing houses work, it could be a year or better before the next book comes out. Yeah, we're still but waiting since on him. We already one. had it. What but if you've got two volumes submitted at one time. Got two volumes submitted at one time. We went ahead and worked on them in parallel, and she released. I think she, I think she released one in October and the other in November, or maybe it was well, November or December. I can't remember. But y'all are not y'all are not going to believe this, and I hate to cut you off, but I don't want to run out of time before you guys tell people where you can be found. Oh, great! So, Stephen, I know this happens all the time. So My Stephanie goodness, is the hour up already? Already. We're just now having fun. <laughs> well, we'll have <laughs> to come back. We have to come back. This is what keeps people coming back to the show is, like Johnny Carson, I'm going to leave him on a cliffhanger. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It's a nice segue. It's got big <laughs> wheels. <laughs> so, Stephanie, tell the people, we know about the Displaced Detective, we know about Division One, so tell the folks where you can be found so they can well, come hunt you, you up. You can find everything um, on Amazon. You can find just about everything on Barnes Noble. If, if print is what you're looking for, all the print stuff is also available at Barnes Noble. Um, a lot of the stuff is available at Books A Million. If you've got any questions as, as to what I've got out there or where it can be found, your best bet is to go to my website, www.stephanie-osborne.com. All right, Mr. Dan. 
Well, uh, let's see. Everything I've got out at the moment is available on Amazon, whether it's musical or written. Uh, Let's see. The physical CDs are best bought through CreateSpace. Bandcamp lets you listen to things for free, and you can also buy digital downloads there, and you can pay whatever the list price was that I had. Uh, the pittance that I had asked for, or you could uh, do as some people have done and, and, and pay what you choose to pay over that amount. Um, uh, my last 20 years of work is available on Apelian Webzine. Just Google Apelian Webzine. You'll get thousands of hits. Um, the best way to find my publicity page is to go to Apelian, read one of the editorials, and click on the link to my publicity page at the bottom of the editorial. Um, Apelian's been going for 20 years now. It's a permanent floating writer's workshop. We've got over 250 writers that have submitted stories over the last 20 years that have become professional writers now. Lots of them, their names you would recognize. Uh, We're read in over 97 countries around the world. Uh, We had a million readers uh, by our 10th anniversary. We had 2 million readers by the time of our 15th anniversary we're now in our 20th year and we're publishing best of stuff along with the uh, new stuff and what Seth and you forgot your own book yeah you forgot your own book Dan my own oh 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 well new book coming out uh, steam powered dream engines which is being put out by Rogue One Press, which is an uh, imprint of uh, uh, the British Horrified Press. Uh, now I have one story in the anthology, and it's all steampunk-oriented stuff. And, and it's a steampunk western, basically, that would, uh, influenced by H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, as well as uh, lots of historical research that I did while I was writing it. And I did actually win $25 for writing the story in the first place. Yeah. And that's still not the book I'm talking about. Oh, Stephanie well, uh, Marinibrium. Thank you. Ah. <laughs> about two years ago, kind of Dark Oak Press took a, took a chance on publishing my Spaceport Bar stories. Now, this collection is entirely my own work from a shared universe series in which... There is a planet uh, light years away from Earth, which is discovered in the year 3140, because it suddenly appeared out of nowhere. And the Terran Alliance sent a mission to find out what's going on here. And all of a sudden they found out there's this bar that caters to every species imaginable. And the bartender's name is Max, and and we're gonna run nobody out of knows time. who actually owns the place. But I often show up as a guest, and people treat me nice. There and you go. It's one of those things where, you know, the bar where everybody knows your name. Well, this is the mm-hmm. bar where anything can possibly happen. So it's crossover central for all kinds of science fiction and fantasy and horror and uh, whatever references that writers tend to throw into things and know that they'll never get published. So ladies and and gentlemen, I hate to interrupt Dan, but we're really running out of time. We got 90 seconds left. You can find Stephanie Osborne and Dan Hollyfield on Facebook. Thank you both so much. I love you both so much. Tomorrow night, ladies You're welcome. Don't hang up after we go dark, though. Tomorrow night at 8 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time, K.J. Howe will be my guest. She is a new guest on Saturday night at 8 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. Kathy Winfield, who is also an author, will be my guest. And you all know what I say at the end of the show. If you want to be successful, stop asking permission. Don't just feel special. Be special. 
Your smile is your logo. Your personality is your business card. How you leave others feeling after having an experience with you. Ladies and gentlemen, you all know that that is indeed our trademark. And if you don't believe me, try it. So don't forget, go and look Dan and Stephanie up. Buy their books. Buy Dan's music. And until tomorrow night at 8 o'clock, this is your host, Yvonne Mason, on Off the Chain with author Stephanie Osborne and author Dan Hollyfield, and we say good night. Okay, we're off the air, guys, but I wanted to tell you, thank you again. This I don't know where the hour went. It flew by. It did. Well, I kept talking. That's the problem. I kept talking. <laughs> That's okay. Y'all get to come back. Y'all, y'all get to come back. Um, when this thing goes up into archives, I will post it on my page and then tag you two in it. And then tomorrow I will put up the podcast and tag y'all in it. Please feel free to pimp it everywhere. Okay. Of course. You know it. And in, absolutely. So until tomorrow night, well, until I get you guys back on, on the show, Stephanie, you're coming back in January. Dan, you're coming back next month, I think, with with um With Eddie, Sullivan. yeah. Yeah, and we he's uh, one of my former editors and now a pro writer, so uh, that ought to be interesting. It'll be fun. So, And, Stephanie, I'll send you some dates, honey, to get you back in January so we can get pimp out your new series. Well, next month is going to be all about Eddie, really. I mean, uh, he deserves the, the, the chance to shine. He's a good writer. Well, he's been on the show. He has been on the show before. So until I hook up with you guys again, thank you again. I love you both very, very much. You're both so special to me. I, I can't hold a candle to your oh. to your craft, and I appreciate oh, no, you both. Don't, don't go. Oh, oh, sure. Uh, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> I am serious. Just because we're in different genres doesn't mean you're not our peer. Exactly. <laughs> when you're family, I, I just, I, y'all just out. Y'all, y'all shine so bright, and I am so proud and honored to call you friend. I can say I know a a musician and a rocket scientist. It doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> I think she's nailed us to the wall on that one. I don't. I don't have a comeback for that. <laughs> oh, and and uh, and now Taylor Hotch wants me to bring my my acoustic bass guitar to Liberty Con so we can get drunk and jam together while she plays well, her, her guitar. That'll be uh, fun. You'll have fun. Yeah, we. So I haven't played in years. I'm tra- I'm trying to redevelop my skills, but uh, I, I I really don't. I'm not practicing often enough because mm-hmm. I've got so much other stuff that takes up my time and well, the, the real world gets practice. in the way. Yeah, but it's raining now, so instead of cutting grass, you can practice your guitar. There you go. No, no, i got to cut the grass. <laughs> i really got to cut the grass. <laughs> well, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. That is the truth. So I'm going to say good night and thank you both for, for the honor and the privilege of having you come on the show. It, I appreciate it so so much. Y'all are wonderful. Oh, Thank the you. honor is ours. Likewise. And I, I will talk to y'all later. Stephanie, don't be tripping over any more cords, honey. I'm doing my best, baby. <laughs> okay. Oh, we forgot something. We well, forgot honey. to mention that Daryl does our covers. We did. Yeah. I, I, I made it. A, I've got a note here written down. Mention that Daryl does the covers. My heart. My husband well, does. People, go ahead. My husband does the covers. Uh, he has done his book, the Marin Ebrim book. Has done most of my covers. Has done all the Division One covers, all of the Displaced Detective covers, and did the cover for the Displaced Detective Suite album. See, and and the people that hear the archives, they will hear this now because all this oh, is going up into archives. So it, they will. Daryl will be heard. Yay. Good. He deserves the credit. He does. He does an excellent job. So on that note, I'm going to say I appreciate you, I love you, and good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, John Boy. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. (laughs) Good night, (laughs) y'all. Hi, 
you've reached the high fashion hotline. Hi, my family's going to a picnic, but our clothes are stained. That's quite a pickle. Ketchup, actually. We want to look amazing. Go to Old Navy. Old Navy? Yep, right now, get up to 50% off all tees, all tanks, all shorts, and all dresses at Old Navy and Old Navy.com. All up to 50% off? Yes, get tees and tanks from $6 for adults, $5 for kids, and dresses start at $15 for women, $10 for girls. Hey, everyone, we're going to Old Navy. High fashion, Old Navy. Valid 621 to 627. Excludes clearance, jewelry, active, flat tees and tanks, licensed, and men's package tops. You've waited all year, and this Saturday, it's finally here. Old Navy's famous $1 flip-flops are back for just one day only. Polish up your petties and hurry in for flip-flops for the whole family for just a buck. This Saturday only at Old Navy and OldNavy.com. Valid 624, limit 10. Solid colors only.